America is made up of communities where people gain a sense of identity and belonging. America is also a society with complex social structures organized to meet the needs of its people. And as a political entity, America is a nation. Within this nation, this society, and these communities, individuals live, work, and play together in groups, creating the meaning and values that shape their lives. Society is more than just groups of people. It is a meaningful social structure that organizes and bonds its members to carry out the major functions of life, such as reproduction, sustenance, shelter, and defense. Societies are not static. They evolve and become more complex as their social structures change. Such change can be seen in shifts in social groups, relationships, and socially defined positions. The earliest type of society is known as the hunting and gathering society. Hunting and gathering societies were really the first kind of societies that human beings developed. A hunting and gathering society is one that sometimes is called a foraging society in which people get all their food and livelihood from what they can hunt and or scavenge or find on the land. They basically work together, live together, worship together, play together as an entity. Within the groups that form societies, people develop relationships. Sociologists use the German words Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft to define the interactions that form these relationships. Gemeinschaft refers to close personal interactions among small groups and communities. Gesellschaft refers to the well-organized but impersonal relationships of modern societies. Hunting and gathering societies were primarily Gemeinschaft type societies. People knew each other, they interacted face to face, small groups, probably at most 25, 50 members tops in any one of these groups. Essentially, it's a group in which either everyone makes it or nobody makes it. For that reason, then, there's a strong sense of Gemeinschaft in these kinds of societies because the people want to have a strong feeling of camaraderie. They have a lot of overlapping relationships. They're very intimate. They get to know each other from birth until death and in every single way. The building blocks of society are social groups. Some groups involve intimate face-to-face -face association and cooperation. These are called primary groups. A secondary group is less intimate and involves more formal associations. Hunting and gathering societies are organized around primary groups because in that kind of a society, everyone is linked by family, by work, by play and religion. And so they are essentially primary groups. In societies, individuals hold certain positions called statuses. The behaviors that societies expect from people in these positions are called roles. Roles vary based on the type of society. The hunting and gathering society is the most egalitarian form of society, since its people cannot accumulate the possessions and wealth that create divisions among the haves and have-nots. The roles and statuses in hunting and gathering societies revolve around primarily age and sex so that little boys at the very beginning know exactly who and what they're going to be as they grow up. They're going to imitate what they see men doing for hunting and making tools. Little girls are going to be imitating what their mothers are doing in terms of nurturing, taking care of siblings, taking care of finding edible plants, preparing food, and making the domestic life work. Another type of society that sociologists explore is the horticultural and pastoral society. These societies grew out of experiments with the domestication of animals and planting of crops. The members of the horticultural and pastoral societies maintain intimate social interactions. 
In both cases, there's still a strong sense of Gemeinschaft in that people are working together, living together, playing together, worshiping together in strong, close-knit groups. As in the hunting and gathering societies, the social groups in the horticultural and pastoral societies are mostly primary groups. But what about roles and statuses? People know pretty much who they are and where they fit into society in terms of you know, what's been told for them and modeled for them. There isn't a whole lot of distinction between people in terms of specialized tasks or chores, and there aren't a lot of opportunities to do much other than what they've seen their parents and their friends and their neighbors doing. The agrarian society developed because of the animal-drawn plow. Within this society, the first cities emerged. These cities contained only a small proportion of the population, but they marked a trend for the future. Agrarian-based societies are those in which people are intensively basing their lives on agriculture. Um, because of that, you have more people, you have larger communities, you have more people to know, and a little bit more diversification and specialization. How did this population growth affect social interactions? There's still a strong sense of Gemeinschaft in which people have a strong sense of solidarity and a sense of community and a sense of belonging. But there probably is the possibility for Gesellschaft-like relationships developing within the context of the larger society. The emergence of the agrarian society brought about changes in the social groups within society. The primary group remains strong, but secondary groups begin to appear. This is because towns are forming and travel is becoming more common. Secondary types of relationships, which are characterized as more detached, with less of an emotional commitment to them, are certainly going to be developing in those relationships beyond the initial community within which people work and live. Changes are also taking place in terms of roles and statuses. In an agrarian society, you really begin to see the segmentation of society into very distinct roles and statuses. And you also begin to see, for the first time, very, very strong differences between uh, positions. And you start to see inequality um, emerge probably at its highest levels in most of the societies we've ever known. The most dramatic change from rural to urban living in America occurred as the result of the Industrial Revolution. In 1860, 90% of the population of the United States worked at jobs directly related to farming. A mere 100 years later, in 1960, only about 8% of Americans were involved with agriculture. Yet these farmers were able to feed a population exceeding 200 million people. This population shift led to the formation of the Industrial Society. Members of the Industrial Society saw the strong emergence of social interactions labeled Gesellschaft. There's this sense that we've lost something as we've moved into an industrial society and an urbanized society where it's harder to associate with each other with a sense of trust now. The impact of primary groups tends to decrease in an industrial society. As most interactions become less personal, secondary groups become more important. In industrial societies, we oftentimes have a, a lot of associates and very few friends, or a lot of associates and, and very, very few people who we consider part of our primary groups. Just as interactions become more impersonal, roles and statuses change as well. Roles and statuses begin to become, for one thing, more multiple, and for another thing, they change in their nature and focus in an industrial setting. The United States is now considered to be a post-industrial society. How do the social interactions of the members of a post-industrial society change? Certainly in a post-industrial society, we see the convergence of communication and electronic technology. And some may see this as having the effect of creating a more gazelle-shop-like society, where people are less personally connected with one another and more oriented towards specific actions with specific consequences and outcomes. 
While most of the social interactions in a post-industrial society are Gesellschaft in nature, aspects of Gemeinschaft exist in specific situations and events. Gemeinschaft appears to be much more of a possibility, but in a very different form than we've ever imagined it in post-industrial society. For example, the events of September 11, 2001, because of the rapidity of the technology, people were instantaneously aware of what was going on, and it brought about a stronger sense of solidarity and a feeling of we-ness and a feeling of togetherness and connectedness among and between the members of the American society. The nature of social groups has also changed. The number of primary associations we have actually decreases, although the intensity may increase. The number of secondary relationships, on the other hand, increases enormously. The roles and statuses of the members of the post-industrial society have also changed. In a post-industrial society, I think we see, because of the technology, the blurring, if not the dissolving, of some of the traditional boundaries, especially in terms of male and female statuses. We may also see a changing in terms of roles connected with those statuses because the kinds of skills and the kinds of things that are necessary now are not the same things we've had in the past. Societies change, some more quickly than others. One way to understand societal change is to explore it in terms of Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, primary and secondary groups, and role and status. These are some of the characteristics of societies now and in the future. of the United States of America into the republic for which it stands, one nation. When the United States of America was formed, it claimed nation status. Then and now, it displayed the characteristics that define a nation. First, it is sovereign, which means it has the right to govern. Second, its members believe it to be legitimate, which means that they themselves give the nation its power. Third, it operates the society's governmental institutions. But within the United States, there exists another nation, the Cherokee Nation. Cherokee Nation is a dependent domestic nation, as denominated by the U.S. Supreme Court in the case of, of Worcester versus Georgia and Cherokee Nation versus Georgia in 1830 and 1832. So as early as 1721, we were acknowledging the world community as a nation. Today, the Cherokee Nation continues to display the characteristics that define a nation, including sovereignty. Fundamental principle of Indian law is that tribes have all the sovereignty of any country in the world, except those attributes that have been specifically taken away by treaty or statute. We have a functioning tribal government. We have elections. We elect our principal chief, our uh, council, our legislative branch. Our courts issue decisions. We run law enforcement. We run our own school. Members of the Cherokee Nation hold dual citizenship. They are both Cherokees and Americans. You can be a member of the Cherokee Nation without being physically located or resident in the Cherokee Nation proper, just as a United States citizen can go to Canada or France or South America and retain his citizenship. And so you can look at the Cherokee Nation in several ways. Uh, one, we do have geographic boundaries, but actually what the Cherokee Nation is more powerfully, it's a nation of people. By examining the Cherokee Nation, we can better understand the characteristics that define a nation. There are many different types of communities. Some are small. Some are large. Some can be found on a map. 
and others are free from geographical boundaries. Although they may look very different, they all serve the same purpose. They provide a framework in which the members can support and reaffirm one another. Community is that thing that no one has ever been able to satisfactorily define. It's something that we feel. It's been defined by place, it's been defined by associations, it's been defined by feelings. Communities can be territorial or non-territorial. A territorial community is defined geographically. Take Sherman Oaks, a community within the Los Angeles area, for example. Sherman Oaks would be a good example of a territorial community because it's bounded by geographical landmarks, by particular streets with particular names. It has identifiable churches and schools and shopping malls and other places where people can identify as belonging to that particular community. Territorial communities offer more than well-defined boundaries. It provide a sense of stability and continuity because when people get out their door in the morning they know that the people that they're going to see on a daily basis whether it be the school or the church or the post office or the store down the street or the gasoline station are always going to be there so it gives them a sense of you know life is okay oh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. bishop stewart is a resident of sherman oaks he is also a professional actor who feels that Sherman Oaks is better suited to his lifestyle than other local communities. The rent's a lot cheaper here, a uh, very nice, quiet neighborhood. Uh, once you go over Laurel Canyon, uh, you get more congested with the traffic, there's more people, it's really rushed. Here it's more relaxed and very quiet. Uh, so it's a very peaceful place. It's a nice place to live. A non-territorial community is not defined by geographical boundaries. It's based on shared values and interests, and its members do not necessarily live close to one another. An example would be a community of professional actors. A non-territorial community like actors are held together by a common occupation. And along with this occupation, of course, they get a common uh, view of life, a common lifestyle, if you will. Why me, man? When I saw you on the news, I knew you were the one. Nah, sorry old man. You got the wrong brother. Bishop Stewart, who has appeared in movies, commercials, and television series, is also an active member of this community. No sign of the rest of the squad. You know, I open up to you and, and you just belittle me. When you're around other people to continually push you, and as you see them advance, it makes you want to advance at the same time. So if you're reading and you're working with someone whose skills are good, that can only enhance what you are doing. People with similar interests are now able to form bonds regardless of their location and establish what are known as virtual communities, a result of the Internet. Virtual communities serve much the same purpose for their members as non-territorial communities serve, but they are more readily accessible to everyone. People in New York, Los Angeles, or in some other country can interact with one another. But also, people of different age groups and different backgrounds, people of different racial and ethnic groups, people of different religious backgrounds, may in fact find somebody online, may find a chat room, may find a list, and find that they have something in common. The ability to traverse space, the ability to instantaneously talk with somebody who lives on the other side of the world and keep an association alive uh, can't be underestimated. It also means that there are far more opportunities to seek out people who think the way you do and who feel the way you do and who want to do the same kinds of things that you do. Emailing is great. I have friends that email, uh, we email each other constantly. They'll email me their headshots and resumes as I'll email them mine. Uh, we try to help each other out and find uh, different work for each other. Whether communities are defined by their physical boundaries or by their members' shared interests and values, they form the social structures in which we all exist. It is within these communities that we pursue meaningful activities and strengthen our identities.
Santa Fe, New Mexico, an exclusive arts mecca and a destination for wealthy Asians, Europeans, and Hollywood celebrities. A showcase for New Mexico's breathtaking palette of turquoise and earth tones where desert and mountains meet. But as sharply contrasted as the landscape, the residents of Santa Fe belong to two distinct and opposing realms. There are the wealthy tourists, who, enchanted by the unique architecture, the bustling art scene, and the high desert air, decide to buy into the charm of Santa Fe for the long term. And there are the locals, who come from a long line of Santa Feans. They feel strong ties to the history and culture of the town. But because the pay scale is low and property values continue to escalate, many of them are being displaced. Change is inevitable when newcomers enter a community such as Santa Fe. But the reactions to this change vary. While some locals feel that newcomers threaten the very qualities that make the town unique, others welcome the economic and cultural possibilities that new blood can bring to the table. The debate over change in Santa Fe has been going on for a long time. People with money have moved their businesses here. And that means that the employment opportunities for people are greater. That means that the quality of life for local people who can gain employment in these new businesses is enhanced. Well, I think the wealth that's come into Santa Fe has given us some good things and given us some bad things. I mean, for instance, for a town our size, we have a lot more cultural institutions, a lot more nice restaurants, things like that, that you can enjoy if you have some money. The bad things it's given us is that it's displaced a lot of older families, a lot of working class and low income families from their original neighborhoods. And it seems to be making Santa Fe a less diverse town as time goes on. I actually see the changes that have taken place over the last 20, 30 years as good for the community. Back when I was growing up, Santa Fe was a relatively poor community. Um, and it just, the quality of life has just increased tremendously. There's a lot more traffic. You see a lot more wealth, a lot bigger houses, more art galleries, more jewelry stores. Whereas before, like say on the plaza, for example, it was mainly local native folks who, who had shops there. That's where we used to shop for clothes, for groceries. All our everyday items were purchased downtown. Now it's all galleries and, and boutiques and, and upper end stores. A lot of people are coming from Chicago, from California, from New York, and they're finding homes here and are actually living here year-round for the most part. Uh, with that surge of energy, uh, of course, prices have gone up, rents have gone up. I think a lot of the native people are not able to afford houses in Santa Fe. If you would look on the outskirts of Santa Fe, you see a lot of the mobile homes, and that's where a lot of the native people are living, you know, out, outside the city limits. And with the property taxes, they have gone up so skyrocketing, my grandma is barely able to afford the taxes. A lot has changed up there, you know, there's maybe three people on the street who are natives of Santa Fe. Just as the locals must accommodate the new members of their community, these new members are expected to adapt to their chosen home. But one of the changes that wealthy newcomers have brought to Santa Fe is the development of gated communities. Gated community is a contradiction in terms. I mean, if you're not part of the town, if you don't want to have interchange and interaction with your neighbors around you, then I wouldn't call that a community. I would call it some sort of bizarre housing project. There are some gated communities that are in the $120,000, $130,000 range, and, and there are some that are a million plus. So I don't find that representative of anything other than someone's desire to feel a little bit safer. I personally find gated communities offensive. Um, it's an attitude of, of us versus them. Most people who live in gated communities here in Santa Fe, not all but most of them have moved here from somewhere else. Communities change. Whether its members embrace change or resist it, can determine the impact of that change. I'm hopeful that we will find ways of remaining a diverse and affordable community where the people who work here can also live here, 
Because when you talk to people in town, that's what most of them want. I think that the most important thing about that, what's important about Santa Fe is not the height of our parapets or the color of the adobe, it is the manner in which we treat one another as Santa Feans. Every place changes, change is a part of life. But I think we, we, we really need to work together, learn how to work together, learn how to respect one another um, as individuals, as human beings, whether you're Hispanic or Anglo or Native American or whatever. The challenges faced by Santa Fe are typical of many communities in today's mobile society. How we address those challenges can determine the future of our communities. Societies around the world may appear to be very different, but they all can be defined using common characteristics. Communities and nations can transcend geographic boundaries. They are often defined by the shared values and interests of their members. Communities, societies, nations, all are constantly evolving, constantly changing to meet the needs of social groups and all are constantly challenged by the stress that comes with change.